Well, welcome everyone who's joining us here and also about this amount, a little bit more online. So many gals are so excited to study Esther. And um, yeah, you're, you're gonna tell. I'm a little excited too. It's gonna be, it's gonna be a good study. Um, it's always fun to start a new book. Is, I, I don't know, is this just a girl's thing that we're like, it's just, there's something new and you know, we just love that. So I, I know it's really fun to be able to get to do a new study. And I always love that the women's studies, they're pretty and they have all of that. But I hope that you'll always notice that we really purpose to not just be pretty. We wanna be pretty because we're feminine and we're women and that's a great thing. But we also wanna have substance and we wanna really be digging into the word. So it's exciting that this study is something that so many of us here in the Portland area and in Washington and Florida, there's actually 42 different states of gals doing it all over the country in five different countries, which is crazy, yeah. So one of the things that I, I love, whenever we start a new study, I think it's a good opportunity, because there's some of you guys that have never done an athe women's study, or maybe you've done, never done any women's Bible study, or maybe you've done lots of Bible studies and you're like, this is not what I usually see women's Bible studies look like. That is probably true. But one of the things, the meat of what we do here at Athe Creek is weekends and Wednesdays going verse by verse, chapter by chapter through the Bible. So, so, so important. And that is, that is key for us as believers to be really plugged in to our church and, and learning the Bible, the full counsel of God's word. I love that. I love that we have the ability and that we have a church that really supports the women doing studies in like these little, these little chunks. I do this on purpose because I think that we don't really need any help filling our calendars. We're pretty good at that, right? So I love that we can do these chunks where we can do eight weeks and we can pray about, can I be in person? Can I be online? Where we need to be? Because the, the meat and potatoes of what we, need to, we wanna do is you know, plugging into the church on Wednesdays and Sundays and really studying God's word that way. And then Tuesdays is kind of a bonus if we can do it. Now, I'm gonna say this for two different camps because we do funky things, right? We, we tell ourselves that, well, if I can't come to all eight, then I can't come. I'm not coming because I'm gonna miss two or one. Here's the thing, if you come to one, if you come to five, if you come to eight, I love it. It's so great because here's the thing, we have lots of things on the calendars and especially if you're a gal, you're a mama and man, it's a stress on your home for maybe your, your husband gets home late and it's just everybody's frantic, stay home. That's what's awesome about technology. You get to watch this on Wednesday or we have groups that get together and watch things on Friday mornings or Thursday evenings because that works better for them. So I just don't want there to be this weird like pressure that it's like, well, you, you better go because we're gonna take attendance and we're gonna check your homework and we're gonna do it. No, we're not gonna do any of that stuff. So that's kind of there, especially for those that are, uh, that are mamas or you, got, you just got some responsibilities. I always want to make sure we're keeping those priorities in check, right? Now I can flip that coin and say, man, if you are a gal that you've just been in the work world all day, you don't have a lot of home responsibilities at night and you're really tired and you're like, I could stay home and Netflix binge or I could go to church. Get to church, come, <laughs> okay? But think about where you're at and I just want that pressure to be, want to, that to be lifted. So here's the thing on our study of Esther. Now some of you guys might be been at church your whole life. And you're like, man, I've studied Esther over and over and over. I'm gonna talk to two camps on this. Some of you in this room or some of you watching online are brand new believers, or maybe you've never studied the Old Testament, or maybe you're like, so Esther, this is a book in the Bible. And I want to encourage you that there is no such thing as a dumb question when you come and, and, and you know, Amy says some crazy thing and everyone's like nodding and smiling and going, I have no idea what she's talking about. They don't know either, neither do I. You know what I mean? Like we need to stop thinking about that everybody must clearly know all of these things and I'm the only one that I must be the dumb one in the room, right? That is the most amazing thing to me about scripture and studying the Lord, knowing who he is, is that whether you have been saved for five minutes or 50 years, you will never plumb the depths of all there is to know about him and his word. So we're all in different places and, there's, and, we've, and we've been in your spot. If you're brand new to the Bible, if you're brand new to church, we've been in your shoes. 
So I want to have a gentle word for our new believers or people that have just not had any exposure to Bible study, that this is a really great group to be with, you know? That you're not looked down upon because you don't know something. That is, we're all in that boat. So then I also wanna turn this and talk to you older believers. Maybe there's some of you here that are, that are in that camp that say, you know what, I've actually studied Esther 81 times, <laughs> okay? And here's what we older believers do. Sometimes we say things like, oh, I've heard this, I know it. And we kind of tune out a little bit. We might t- not try to, but we kind of do. We kind of tune out just a little bit. And, and here's the thing, that is something, you know how Pastor Brett always talks about how repetition is, you know, that's how we learn. Repetition, repetition, repetition. So if, if we say things up here that you've already heard, that's awesome because all of these, the newer believers or the people that might not have heard Esther 81 times, you have an opportunity to pour out to them. And I wanna encourage you to do that. I want you to find people within this study that maybe are, that you just have not met before. They might be one of those that has known the Lord for five minutes. I remember one of our first Bible studies that we did, uh, I guess it's been like two Bible studies ago, and a, a sweet gal came, she didn't have a Bible, she, she had no idea what all of these crazy ladies were doing in here. So just recognize we're all in different places and the Lord could use you to pour out to someone. And don't think that, well, I don't know the Bible quite well enough. Because like I said, that's, that's the same thing that the new believers and the people that aren't super experienced with the Bible, they're saying the same thing to themselves too. Like, I don't know enough. Okay, that's the enemy chirping in your ear, telling you to just be quiet and not be a blessing to others. Because that's one of the things that I love for us being able to come in person and be together with sisters in Christ because we are called to encourage each other. We're called to pray for one another. And it, it's kind of nuts out there, isn't it? It's dark and it, and it feels rough. If you're watching us and you know, you're in Utah and it feels smiley and happy or Texas, it's a little different here, okay? <laughs> So for those of us that are here, sometimes we can't wait to get in these doors because we need these smiles. And so I hope wherever you're at, that you find yourself in a place that you have that countenance to give to someone else. Because I I really think we need each other and ask for prayer and be the person that wants to meet somebody that you've not met before. You're like, Amy, that's really hard to do. I know, because I don't like doing that. But the Lord has called us to that. And you know, just like that song talked about, how worthy is the Lord? You know, he is so worthy, and yet we sit back and we're like, do I have to say anything, though? We need to move past that, and I'm encouraging you to push yourself in that a little bit. We're going to talk in Esther about some some big themes that we see with sovereignty and providence, and and we're going to go through those terms in a little bit. But one of the things that I thought was interesting, and and I'm going to flip there. I don't uh, have any flashy slide for you or anything, but this morning... In my uh, devotions, I was writing in my journal, and you know, I have one of these journals that has a scripture at the, at the very bottom of it, and it's, it's just always random, and it's always in some other translation, and I thought, how amazing is the Lord? Because today on my page, it said Isaiah 25, 1, which says, O Lord, you are my God, I will exalt you. I will praise your name, for you have done wonderful things, plans, forms of old, faithful and sure. And the version I read in this, it was the NIV, and that last part, it read it as, you have done wonderful things, things planned long ago. Think about that. We're gonna read these things in Esther where there's there's such a plan, clear, that's been going on. The Lord is orchestrating, doing all these things. And when I read that today, I thought, man, the Lord knew that today I was gonna be right here. The Lord knew today that you were going to come sit here right into an Esther Bible study. He knows every one of our days planned long ago. He knew what we were going to do. That is amazing. And then it takes you back to the beginning of that verse where it says, I will praise you. I love that. But the timing of all of those things is so fun. So let's dig into Esther a little bit. I wanna share, I'm gonna give a little bit of an introduction, a little bit of some Esther fun facts, a little bit of some history. So if you're like, ooh, do I hate history? Well, (laughs) hope you got a cup of coffee because it's kind of fun. All right, so let's first start with a little bit of some Esther fun facts here. 
um, just so we get a basic idea of the book and what we're talking about here. So the author of this book is possibly Mordecai. You're gonna hear me say possibly and approximate and things like that a lot in this because you, some of these things we aren't completely certain of. But Mordecai, you read about Mordecai, he's the uncle, he's the guardian of Esther in our story. So he is probably the author of this book. But again, can't be totally sure. The date that it was written is approximately 486 BC. So this takes place somewhere in between Ezra chapter six and Ezra chapter seven. That's basically around the, the time period that this will be. Next week, you're gonna dig into a timeline. <laughs> it's so fun, guys. So um, that will help me. But I, I, I actually, I'm not doing that to be super mean. I really think it's helpful for us to see where these events land. So I, it helps keep us organized a little bit. The setting of this is in uh, Persia's capital, which is the city of Susa. This was one of Darius's palaces. This was actually considered his winter palace because everybody needs a winter and a summer palace, especially if you live in Oregon, right? But um, so that's what it said. And the, the unique thing about Esther, the only one other book is like this in the Bible, and the name of God is not mentioned, not once. And yet, you know where I'm going to go with this. He's everywhere in this book. He is, man, he is on every page. You just, you just see it. But he's never named in the book of Esther. It's very interesting. Another thing that I thought was kind of cool about Esther is that it was recognized as part of scripture well before the time of Christ. There's a couple places you can read where they'll say, well, maybe this wasn't supposed to be in the canon, but it's honestly, it's, it's real thin. For the most part, everybody agreed very early on that Esther was scripture. Now, I, I'm intentionally using that word. It's in our Bible. It is scripture. When we read in the New Testament, Jesus refers to the scriptures. He refers to the Old Testament. He's talking about Esther. He's talking about all of the Old Testament, all of scripture. And I just wanna remind us, because sometimes we can think, well, how is this sweet little fairy tale, which it's kind of not, how does that come in? But 2 Timothy 3, 16 through 17 says, all scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction and for training in righteousness that the man of God may be complete and equipped for every good work. Those words apply to Esther. We will find correction in here. We will find reproof. We'll find training in righteousness. We'll find equipping within Esther because it's scripture. And it's all scripture is breathed out by God. It's all inspired. We can't leave any of it out. Now, one of the things when you come to Esther, sometimes, you know, and, and the, the critics just love to do this. They love to discredit anything about the Bible that they can. Like, okay, these people didn't really exist, and this is a sweet little fairy tale, but we know this didn't happen, and all this stuff. And, and sometimes they'll try to do it with archaeological evidence, which every time it's either they haven't dug it up yet, but they are always wrong with these things. But I have uncovered in, in my nerdiness some things about the historical context of Esther that I think is interesting as we kind of go into this book. So one of the things I want to show you, this, this very attractive woman here, is uh, now there's argument on who she is. She could, there, she's a Persian queen for sure. And some people say she is Queen Atossa, which would be, um, or it would be Xerxes, who is our king in the story here. Ahasuerus and Xerxes, depend on the translation you have, same dude. This could have been his mom, or some say this was a queen named Amestris. So Amestris, again, who is this gal? She's interesting to me. Some say that she might have been a, someone that was one of Xerxes' allies that they married. They did that a lot back then, but she was a very favored queen of Xerxes. And They've used this character, they've used rather the book of Esther to say, well, we know there was Queen Amestris and they, we know that there was Queen Atossa, that would have happened before the events in Esther. These people, Vashti, Esther, this is not a thing. Well, this is when I think it's fun to see how archeological evidence and things that kind of get, get turned up, how they always prove the Bible is true. So with this gal, I wanna give you a couple names for some things that you will see. Definitely there's gonna be a quiz on how to write the Persian of that, so write that down. So these are some names, they, you know, they were big in the ancient world with kind of the double name. Sometimes there was their Greek name. Uh, you know, when the, when the Jews were taken captive, 
they would go to Assyria, they would go to Babylon, whichever where they were taken, and they would be given a different name. Remember Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego? They were all given Babylonian names. They had, those were their Babylonian names, except for Daniel, he hung on to his. But they are given different names, and this happens quite a bit. And so sometimes this could contribute to some of the confusion um, that we see with Queen Vashti and Amestris and Esther and who these people are, were they the same? Now, next week, I give you a little blurb about Vashti that kind of is one theory. Sometimes people say, well, Vashti, maybe she was, um, maybe she was a mistress. It's, it's a, tricky to make the timelines match with that because since Vashti was removed at a certain period of time, uh, Queen Amestris lived much, much longer. She had a much bigger impact. So I think there's some issues with that. Also, Vashti could have been even a title. You know, you'll notice there in the meaning of her name, excellent, desired, beloved, it might not have even been her name. So we're not totally sure as much who that is. But then we also wonder about this Amestra scout. It's, as I read this, what I love is there's certain things that we know from outside of biblical, from outside of the biblical account, from what we can see in, in history. One of those things is that following the events that happened here in Esther, that of course the critics say just didn't exist, that Jewish names start appearing in Persian official records. Interesting. They didn't, not before, but something happens during this particular time period and then all of a sudden we start seeing these, per, these um, Jewish names that are in the record. That's interesting. We also can see in policy decisions and things that were done within the ancient world right there in Persia during their uh, Persian empire, that the attitude seems to change even towards the captives. Here's one of the things I wanna show you, and here's just some food for thought. I can't like, I can't prove it because I can't go back this many years. But do you remember if you were with us for New Mercies, we talked about Nehemiah a little bit. So Nehemiah is kind of, this is, it's in the same time period. And I won't go into the story because it's, it's too long, but it's super cool. Nehemiah is a captive there in, um, in Syria and he wants to, or in Persia, and he wants to return and he wants to build the city back of Jerusalem. Kind of a, kind of a big ask. Like he goes to the king and he says, so here's the thing. I want, you know, the place that you took captive. I wanna go back. I wanna build the walls back up. I wanna build the gates back up. And would you mind paying for it and securing my safety all the way there? Cool? Kind of a crazy request, but that's exactly what he does. He goes and he tells. Now there's this little tiny verse here tucked away in, um, or an interesting mention, I should say. In Nehemiah 2.6, Nehemiah tells all the stuff to the king. And it says in verse six, and the king said to me, in parentheses here, the queen sitting beside him, how long will you be gone and when you will return? The thing that catches me there is the queen sitting beside him. It's in every translation that I've read that it just makes this note that the queen was there. I could be reading into the text some, but what I can tell you from kind of matching some timelines up and some when people lived, this king that would have been here in Nehemiah would have been Artaxerxes the first. So he would have been Xerxes' son. You may even say Esther's son. This queen is known to be probably a mistress. Now, when Artaxerxes took the throne, it was when his dad, Xerxes, died, and Artaxerxes was 10 years old. When kings took the throne when they were pretty young, mom helped out. And so the queen Esther, which in this case could have been Queen Amestris, she was the queen consort of, so of sorts. So it is possible that this queen that is mentioned sitting right beside Artaxerxes is the same Esther that we read about in the story that actually saved the Jewish people from genocide, right? Now I believe that the Lord could have just stirred the heart of Artaxerxes to go, yes, I will do all that and more. The Lord could absolutely do that. I also think the Lord in his providential hand could have placed Artaxerxes' mom, Esther, possibly a mistress, right there to go, yeah, we're gonna help the people out. It's possible, can't prove it, but it's an interesting thing. It's an interesting thought. So. This would have happened, you do see this policy, these friendly things that seem to happen for the Jewish people after the events of Esther. So those things we can see outside of, our, outside of biblical record. Another thing that's interesting about this, and this is where, so if y'all have never done a study with me, you've never heard all my stories about how when I was, when I was little, I wanted to be an archeologist. 
No, guys, everybody wants to be an archaeologist. Come on. And I just thought that was so fun. And I think that the Lord is so kind because every once in a while, he just drops some real nerdy archaeology things at me. And it's just so, so fun. So I told you there's this legit queen, Queen Amestris, that definitely, she, she lived, she had a long reign. She lived to be pretty old, maybe 79, even 80. And um, interestingly, they find this tomb in Susa in 1901. And they can see from the tomb, there's, there's no religious markings in it, which is a little odd because usually this, uh, the Syrians would have had you know, their false gods and you know, crazy stuff in there. It's an unmarked, there's no religious markings in it. They can tell that it is a woman. The bones are smaller. They can tell her age, that she was older based on how her teeth are. There are, within the, in the tomb itself, it looked basically like a big bronze bathtub. There is all kinds of jewels and things that would have been very consistent with royalty. There is this crazy crown thing that I'm gonna show you when we get to chapter two that was in this as well, which, was, which would have been pretty unique. Now, her name is nowhere. That, again, it's not totally uncommon, but the names that do appear are the names of two kings, Artaxerxes I and Xerxes I. And that would have been often how they would mark a, a particular tomb or for who was buried there based on who reigned during that time. So they have, you've got all of these royal things that are in there kind of marking that this was a person that was at the very least significant, but perhaps even a queen herself. She's in Susa. Her tomb is facing westward, which is kind of unique because it would have been facing actually towards Jerusalem. So you're gonna get, to, get you're gonna hear from me. There's a few little elements here that we start seeing. Maybe this woman actually had some Jewish connection here because there was two different items within her tomb that made no sense at all. All the royal stuff, all the jewels, all that stuff, all the crown. And then there were these two shekel coins. Weird minted around the same time that Esther would have lived, the same time that a, a mistress would have ruled. And, and there's just these two random, like basically worthless coins. But if you're Jewish, those shekel coins actually equated to what the temple tax would have been at that time. So it's just interesting that she would have, that she would have had these. Another thing that was in her tomb are these. So these cylinder, there, used, there were some things that looked kind of similar to this that were cylinder uh, seals where they would actually make their seal. This is not a cylinder seal, but instead this was like a pendant that she would have worn, that this woman wore. And what these are is they, at that time, these would have been noted as being a symbol of the Torah. These would have been the two Torah scrolls. So we can't prove it, but is it kind of cool? It's kind of cool. So we, this, this tomb, you know, 1901, it ended up getting completely destroyed. They can't even do much more investigation on it. The only reason we even have the pictures that we have is that they took the items. This is in the Louvre right now. But then the, actually what's in the, the coffin itself, the picture of it, is just even a watercolor because it ended up getting destroyed and we can't even study it anymore. So do we need to know? Does any of that fun fact stuff really matter when you study Esther? Maybe not. Maybe it's just trivia and maybe it's just, you know, extra. But I do find that it gives, I, I just like the full breadth that when we're reading scripture, this is not a fairy tale. This is actually a real person that really lived. And, and so when we get to see different things and different ideas about who these people are, I think it helps us to remember they were real people too. But I, I think that with Esther in particular, we've all been hearing the Cinderella version, haven't we? You know, for those of you that you're like on the 81 times you've learned Esther, you've colored all the pictures, you know, you were, you, you did the Esther play at church camp in the summer, and I mean, you get this. And it was, it's so, it's just this sweet little rags to riches Cinderella story, right? Well, I'm sorry, but I'm probably going to taint that image just a smidge. Because Esther in the book, the Persian Empire itself, is a whole lot more gritty, than that. I had to be careful. I, I, have a, I have a group of friends that we Marco a lot. And so sometimes I'll throw little softballs out like, so will anybody completely pass out in their chair if I say this that they did, you know? So they're usually a good testing sample for me on, yeah, don't, don't do that, Amy. Don't, don't say that. Because I'm just saying, like any really terrible, like torture scene that you have ever heard of or seen in a movie, what the Persians did, 10 times worse. This is a brutal, brutal group of people. 
Lying is a capital punishment there. Capital punishment. You die. And they find really unique ways to kill you. They, they were even so torturous in their things that they would kind of like, they would torture someone, but then they'd kind of nurse them back to health a little bit, let them feel peppy, and then they'd start again. They were a really brutal people. And I say this, guys, because when we get to the part where Esther is thinking about like what she's gonna have to go do, I'm just saying, gals, this was not, I'm not the, I was not the winner. I was not picked to do a beauty pageant and get a one-year spa treatment. I mean, probably in our day, what we could probably liken the fear, the, what she was going through, it probably felt a little bit more like how we would color sex trafficking today than you're the winner of a beauty pageant. That's Persia. So you're like, thanks a lot, Aim. I really liked my Cinderella version a lot better. But the reason I think it's so important for us to understand a little bit of that without me getting too gory, if you, if you can handle it. See, I'm, I'm a boy mom, so I don't get real queasy about stuff. So if you're super curious, you can go and look it up and you'll be appalled. But the, the reason I think that's important is because just of the things that we were talking about a little bit ago when we started, that it's kind of dark here. It's not even kind of dark. It's really dark. Our world is, I mean, unless you just do not read the news, it is, this is not a pleasant time right now, is it? And I feel in some ways, just as we knew that today was the day we were gonna start to study Esther, the Lord knew exactly what our day was gonna look like. He knew exactly what your newsfeed was gonna look like. As shocked as we are at the depravity that is now on display, the Lord knew. And it's that backdrop, it's that backdrop of this unbelievably torturous, evil, wicked Persian empire and the rulers and some crazy kings those, that's the backdrop for all of these amazing things that God is working behind the scenes. Now again, his name's not there. They don't see it. And I sometimes wonder if we're in that same way. How could God possibly be moving in all of this? But that's again where I just think we see these parallels. We see that he's absolutely working in all of this. I bet there's all kinds of stories here about things that you guys have experienced where you have seen the providential hand of God just kind of working in the background. And usually the most horrible, deep, horrible pits of your life. He was working, he was moving. And we're gonna see that all the way through Esther. I love that. But this is, this is very consistent. This darkness, there's like always like a, a certain veneer that we like to give things. Just like we like to have Esther be a little bit more of a Cinderella story, you know, um, we, we do the same stuff, right? Nobody gets up first thing in the morning and snaps a quick picture to post on Instagram. Nope, 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 nope. We're gonna wait till we've, you know, at least done something. We've painted the barn just a smidge and then we'll put that picture out, right? We, we do that too. We kind of put out the highlights. We can portray Esther as kind of a highlight. I think of back World War II, right? They, uh, we can look back at World War II and just be uh, like unbelievable the atrocities that the Nazis did. But what do you think about, like, how did, how did the world let that happen, right? Like, if you go to the Holocaust Museum, it's, and it's so interesting and so sad. But the rest of the world, we're seeing these really cool posters of families. I, I, I looked up a bunch of these, these posters that the Nazis would put out as propaganda to promote that what they were doing was for the community and for health care and, you know, just boosting the family. That's what they were telling the world. That's what they were telling, you know, even people within their city, but, but they weren't necessarily showing the things where there was hospitals where disabled were being killed. And then, of course, all the things that happened to the Jews. I mean, there was awful things happening, but what they showed, the propaganda that was out there, they just kind of put this nice little Instagram reel, the highlight reel. And we like to look at things through those rose-colored glasses. And in, and in that case, I think it kept the world from getting involved in all these people dying because we were looking at things through rose-colored glasses. I don't want us to do that with Esther. Let's look at it for what it is. Let's look at our world for what it is. Because as, as dark and as dire as our circumstances may be, our God is greater. Our God is the one that is in control and can do so much. So I told you there's gonna be two big themes that we study here in Esther, and they kind of go together, but I wanna, I wanna explain them separately. So. The first thing that we see is the sovereignty of God. And this is a definition of that. God's sovereignty refers to his absolute and unrivaled rule over all of his creatures and their circumstances. 
absolute, total control over all things. He is our sovereign. This is an attribute of our unchanging God. Can't do anything about this, this just is. Many scriptures we could look at for this, but I, here's a couple of them. Deuteronomy 10, 14. Behold, to the Lord your God belong heaven and the heaven of heavens, the earth with all that is in it. There is nothing that he doesn't see. There's nothing that he doesn't know. He sees it all. He's in control of it all. Psalm 103, 19. It says, the Lord has established his throne in the heavens and his kingdom rules over all. Established, firm. He doesn't have to think about it. It's firm. He's ruling over all that he has. Spurgeon said this about sovereignty. He said, when you go through a trial, the sovereignty of God is the pillow upon which you lay your head. I, I can't possibly think of a better term, a better definition really for sovereignty than that one right there. Because sovereignty is the reason why as horrible as it was for Esther in the Persian Empire and the things that were going on as the Jews were in exile there, as awful as it is to live where we are sometimes right now with the things going on, the Lord is sovereign. I could just pack it up and go home right now. The Lord is sovereign. We, we don't have to freak out. We don't have to stress because we can rest our head on the sovereignty of the Lord, that he is the one ruling over all of it and working in ways that we never could possibly do. There's such peace in this unchanging reality that God is sovereign no matter what. The second word that we, term that we kind of look into is providence. And, and, I, and sometimes even people just kind of lump these together, but I'm gonna, I'm gonna make a case for a little bit of a distinction. But providence is the governing power of God that oversees his creation and works out his plans for it. It could be a little bit of nuance here, but how I think of providence is this. His providence is how he carries out his sovereignty through the actions of his, cre of his creation. He is sovereign. He is king. He is Lord over all. That's who he is. His providence is how he works that all out. How he stirs up the heart of Artaxerxes to let the people go back to, uh, to Jerusalem and rebuild those city walls. How he works in the situations that we're going to read in Esther and just happens to have you know, a, a king not be able to sleep and, you know, have to read a story. Slightly a bit of a spoiler there if you haven't gotten to that part of Esther, but that's the Lord's providence, working in all of those details. I love in, if you ever read any early American documents or you read, um, you know, anything from that period, they would often interchange and they would call providence God. They would like, they put the terms together. They just saw God as providence. And they, and, and they recognize that. The thing, the thing that I love about providence and almost equating it with sovereignty there is there is this yielding to it. We, he is in control and he has this. There's nothing that I need to worry about and wring my hands about and be you know, just all worried about because God's sovereign providential hand already has it established. Isaiah 25, one said long ago, planned long ago. We're just seeing it all unfold. I love Psalm 37, 23, it says, the steps of man are established by the Lord when he delights in his way. Though he fall, he shall not be cast headlong for the Lord upholds his hand. The steps of man are established. I think that's a really important reminder for us because we think that we're planning our week and we're doing our thing, um, and, and, but, but really it's, it's the Lord that's showing us right where to go. He knows where we're going. The Lord is established. Now, there, there's things that we think with this that kind of makes your brain short circuit. You're like, well, wait, wait, didn't I pick up my foot and put it there? Or you're saying that the Lord put it there. When your brain starts doing that, good. Because God is far beyond the capacity of what our little tiny brains can all comprehend, right? So don't get freaked out if it doesn't make total sense. Know that the Lord is sovereign. Know that he can establish your steps and he can use you to make choices to walk within his will, in his perfect will that he has. But I also love in this verse how it says, though he fall, he shall not be cast long. Meaning, you know what? Sometimes we are gonna fall, but he upholds our hand. And I, I know in my own life, I can think of times where it was, it was the falling part. It felt lower than you could possibly go. 
But at the same time, you just had this sense, you had this peace that the Lord, he is there and he's holding your hand. He's not gonna leave you in the hole that you're in. He's established our steps. The thing I wonder is, do we respect our sovereign only when he acts in accordance with our wishes? This is where we gotta check ourselves a little bit because we know that God, God is sovereign whether you decide that you're gonna accept that or not. That's, it's not even up to you. It, it, God is sovereign. So you can, you can choose to ignore it. You can choose to say, nope, I don't accept that. He's still sovereign, just the way it goes. But sometimes we're like, well, we like this sovereign when he's doing things that might make my life really rosy and happy. And that's why I like this little bit darker backdrop to Esther because it wasn't necessarily rosy and happy. And yet the Lord's moving, the Lord's working. The Lord's doing a remarkable thing. Think about the, the stories in the Bible that they probably would have changed their circumstances if they could. Think, think about Naomi. Naomi, she has her, she's moved from her home, her husband dies, and then both of her sons die. Triple grief right there, triple bereavement. Would she have rather gone, can I skip this part? I don't like this particular established plan, thanks. But if she had changed any of those things, what would we not have? Because when Naomi went back to Jerusalem, or went back to Bethlehem, and Ruth meets Boaz, well, then Boaz has Obed, and Obed has Jesse, and Jesse has David, and eventually you work on down to you have the line of Jesus. But that started with kind of a dark backdrop for Naomi, right? That was a bummer. And there's a lot of things in our life that we'd be like, I'd rather skip that part. I'd rather skip that diagnosis. I'd rather skip that loss. I'd rather skip that miscarriage. But yet, the Lord is sovereign. And even when it's dark and even when it's dire and even when it feels like the worst of the worst, he never stops moving. He never stops orchestrating these things. And I, I, I think this is such an important reminder for us. Romans 8.28 says this. It says, and we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good. For those who are called according to his purpose. All things work together. And again, I could say the same, I could go through that whole spiel I just said about, you know, well, we only like it when it's good, our definition of good. Um, and there, otherwise, we don't think so. But that would be us telling scripture that God's lying. Because God says all things work together for the good for those who are called according to his purpose. Now, the Jewish people in our story, the story of Esther, they're God's people. And we're gonna go into this study and you're gonna look even all the way back to the covenant that, that God made with Abraham to preserve the Jewish people. They were his people and he was going to, he was going to keep them. He was not gonna break that covenant. But we also, just like we could see here in Romans, this is, our, is, is assuring us that God's working for our good as well. Even when we don't necessarily see that good, this is where you just remind yourself of that scripture over and over and over. Let it run through your mind. What are you doing, Lord? Even when you don't understand, the Lord is working all things together for the good. Ephesians 1.11 says this, because this is important when we think about, well, if we're called and if we love God, how do we know this? How do we know we belong with him? And Ephesians 1.11 says, in him we have obtained an inheritance, having been predestined according to the purpose of him, of him who works all things according to the counsel of his will. Those are all kinds of sovereignty-ish sounding words in there, right? Being predestined according to his purpose. He's planned, he's purposed you. He's planned and purposed me that I would be here, that I would be doing the things that he has, obtaining an inheritance. Now that's a cool word. Because as we talk about that, we're, we're seeing, we're gonna observe a king all throughout this story and, the, and all the, you know, the crazy stuff he does. But observing our sovereign, that we have an inheritance from him. So how do we come by this inheritance? How do we get into this group that says that we're the called? And that's John 1.12. John 1.12 says, but to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. I don't know about you, but I am fairly certain that most of us, if we're real honest, we do not want to live today on our own 
with all of that going on, with all the crazy going on, figuring out how to raise kids with, you know, some nutty stuff going on in schools and, it, you know, nope. I don't want to do that on my own. I want to know that I belong to my sovereign God. I wanna know that I am one of his kids. And that's really what we are. We are one of the king, we're one of his kids. First John also says this, it says, see what kind of love the father has given to us that we should be called the children of God. And so we are. When we look at this study, we see so many things that would like, you know, with the king, we see things that he was doing. And, and, but we called the study seeing our king. And, you know, I'm, I'm just gonna pull the curtain back real quick and just tell you something really annoying about myself. I'm really bad at naming things. You should ask my team whenever they get to like, cool, what do you wanna call this podcast? What do you wanna call this study? What do you wanna call this? And I'm like, I have no idea. I have no idea. So the debate went on about what this study would be called, um, and it took forever, and they probably got frustrated with me. But today, I realized why it was called that. Because it's a great story. Like, you can, you can read the story of Esther, and like I said, it, like, as an English major, it has all the dramatic elements. It's got villains, it's got, you know, the pretty princess, it's got all the things that made it the Cinderella story in our mind, you know? So it's got those things. But like I said, that because there's actually, if you peel back the layers, there's all this other stuff going on behind the scenes that allows us to see that, oh, there's something more going on there that makes it very applicable to our own life. And while we thankfully don't serve a crazy king like a Ahasuerus, we have our king. And what I'm hoping that we get from, not just tonight, but every night, every page you turn in this, that you're gonna be seeing your king. But if I can make a big issue about little tiny articles like our and the, because he can be the king, because like I said, he is. God is sovereign, nothing you can do about that, whether you choose to believe in him or not, he is sovereign. But is he just the sovereign or is he your sovereign? And, and this is the thing, as you come to any book of the Bible, as you come to anything, this piece of whether or not you have acknowledged, you have believed, like John said, that Jesus died on the cross, rose from the grave, and that you have repented of your sins. If you don't have that, this is just a pretty Bible study. And it's not good for anything. Ladies, whether that is you personally, and you're like, nope, I don't know that I actually believe this stuff. I don't like the ugly, yucky world that we live in, and I, and I refuse to believe that this has, there's plan in this. Well then, welcome to Esther. I'm really glad you're here. Because you're going to see a story of something that was not going well. And yet, it's the Lord, the Father, our King, who loves us, who loves you, who loves you, who loves you, that wants you to be one of his daughters, wants you to be one of his. And he cares for us, and he loves us, and he protects us as our King. So I love that. We're gonna see this over and over. One more quote here by my dude, Spurgeon. In nothing is there chance, but in everything is there a God. Now, Pastor Brett, whenever he, his, he shortens this, and he basically calls this Godowins. Godowins. There's no such thing as coincidence. No such thing. There is only Godowins. In nothing there is chance, but in everything is God. Do you believe that? Because if you don't, then you're saying the Bible's just uh, getting a little superfluous. Je Jeremiah, remember when, uh, when the, in the words of Jeremiah, it says that, that God knew him before he was even in the womb, that he knew that he was going to be a prophet to the people. That's, that's going back a ways. That wasn't special to Jeremiah. The Lord knew that about you. The Lord knew that you were going to be called to be the mom to those kids. The Lord knew you were gonna be called to be the wife of that man. The Lord knew you were gonna be called to a certain period of singleness or a life of singleness. He knew every one of those things. He didn't mess up. He knew exactly what he was doing. There is no chance, but there is a God. While our day, I know it feels, it feels dark, I want us to be able to just step in here or wherever you're joining us, and I want us to be able to be reminded of, man, the Lord 
We have, we, he, he is with us. He's preserving his people and we're gonna watch him do that with the Jewish people, but he, it's no different than he is for us today. He is our king and he is our father and his love is on all of these pages and I can't wait for it. Will you pray with me? Lord Jesus, we're so thankful for your word. Lord, we're thankful for, for what seems to, on the, on the surface, just to be a little story. But you have so much going on behind there. And Lord, I know that that's how it is for all of us in this room. There's so many things that you are working very individually, specifically, even right now. And Lord, I just pray that as we study this book, Lord, I pray we wouldn't miss anything. I pray that you would just open our eyes to the wondrous words of your law. I pray, Lord, that um, there, you would just put a hedge around the distractions, around the things that would tell us that it, we don't want, need to study, that we don't need to do these things. But we would just recognize that that's the enemy that does not want us to be effective in your kingdom. So Lord, I pray that as we study this book, Lord, I just pray it would be a rich time to the, for these gals. I pray it would challenge us. I pray it would encourage us. Lord, I pray that it would just help us to know you more and more. Even in a book where your name is not written, Lord, I pray that we would see new facets, new color to you that we have not seen before. Lord, I pray for every woman that is watching this study, every woman that participates this, every woman that has their Bible in their hand. Lord, I pray that they would not miss the opportunity to be your daughter that they wouldn't try to navigate this crazy upside down world without you. Lord, we thank you for how you love us. We thank you for how you care for us and, and, and the amazing, the thorough, complete counsel you give us in your word, Lord. Lord, I pray we would be challenged, but I also just pray just such a blessing over all of these gals as we study this together. So Lord, I thank you in Jesus' name, amen.